So welcome to our webinar. The webinar today is entitled, How Will the Recent Fuel Price Increase Affect Your Portfolio? Um, so obviously, most of us will know that uh, last week Wednesday, the fuel price increased by 52 cents per litre more for petrol and uh, 85 cents per litre more for diesel. Um, this was on the back of uh, rising international Brent, Brent crude uh, oil prices as well as the weaker exchange rate. Now, this was the third consecutive fuel price increase for motorists. Uh, some of you guys might not <laughs> have realized that. But um, what's painful is that the Automobile, Automobile Association, the AA, has warned um, of another fuel price hike in July. So brace yourself. So um, on the back of that, the rand recently um, this week, or last Friday, broke through the 13 rand to the dollar mark. This is alongside, obviously, all the other emerging markets. And the reason for that is the, um, the investors are switching to asset classes that are deemed less risky um, in the U.S. and also in other developed markets. So this is a bit of a worry. Uh, Looks like it might be a new trend for the RAND. So the RAND has mo uh, weakened markedly. And obviously, um, this is mainly also because of dollar strength and the risk, what they call the risk off uh, 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 attitude, which currently prevails among, uh, amongst overseas investors. So... You must also bear in mind that this sentiment has nothing to do with South Africa and it has impacted on currencies of all emerging economies. Okay, so it is a bit of a worry because obviously as we go through the presentation, you'll see that a weak rand uh, has implications for all of us. So just to start off on the lighter note, he has a little cartoon. Um, so this is an old cartoon. You can see by the date on the cars here, 1993. So uh, the one guy says, come on, Harry, same car, same model, same year, identical mileage, why the price difference? And he says, well, the tank's full. The point I'm trying to make of this like, cartoon, it's an old joke, it was an old, old cartoon, but we're having the same problem. That uh, obviously rising petrol prices um, obviously has impact on all of us. So rising crude oil prices does represent a big threat uh, to, the, to the South African economy in a sense that um, – um, obviously, there's knock-on effects, and we'll talk about it a bit later. The, the oil price, and this is what's scary also, is unlikely to fall below the $70 a barrel, ba uh, a barrel in the near future, and I'll highlight more about that. We were at $30 a barrel way back in December 2015, and we were as high as $76 a barrel last Thursday. Um, Bloomberg last week reported that the oil export to Saudi Arabia wants the oil price to range between $80 and $100. So once the price uh, hits $80 a barrel, it's unlikely to come down. So that is um, a, a worrying fact. He has another little cartoon, just to, as I say, to kick off on a lighter note. Uh, more more recent, you can call it more recent, uh, in the space of our, of our uh, cash and transfer heists. So he's, um, forget the cash heist, this is a fuel hijack. Um, so OPEC, which is a, 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 call it a cartel. OPEC, by the way, those of you that don't know, uh, is an organization for petroleum exporting countries. It's an intergovernment organization of 14 nations. As I say, I call it an oil cartel. Basically, they manipulate the price of oil. Um, but anyway, uh, OPEC re released a monthly report on Wednesday, yesterday, uh, sorry, on Tuesday, yesterday, uh, saying a high degree of uncertainty was hanging over the global oil market. And we'll talk about just now about the, what I call a tug of war what's happening there, but OPEC and other producing countries, including Russia, have cut oil uh, uh, output by 1.8 million barrels per day, and that's since January 2017, and that's the whole idea, as I say, to manipulate prices. If there's less uh, uh, supply, obviously, demand should be going up, but the whole idea was to obviously boost uh, the booster market. Now, OPEC is having a meeting, a meeting in two weeks' time on, between the, on the June the 22nd and 23rd, and the whole idea there is to decide the future of supply policy. Okay, so uh, just to give you that, was just a quick overview intro. So let's go into the nitty gritties. And um, first of all, up, up front, um, I'm not an economist, um, but uh, let's talk about why the recent fuel price increase. So there's quite a few different causes, and uh, oil is a commodity. Those of you that know, it's, it's a commodity. Um, like most things you buy, supply and demand will affect the oil price. When demand is greater than supply, price rises. So, for example, uh, way back in 2014, the U.S. Shell oil producers, 
uh, increase the oil supply by two, uh, increase the oil supply. Now the shale, uh, shale uh, oil producers are just guys that are using un unconventional methods to bring out the, the oil shale. They're using various methods to bring it up. Anyway, there's been a glut of oil on the markets. Um, so oil prices fell. They fell to the lowest level in five years, and that's way back in 2014. You'll see a graph. I'll show you just now uh, a chart of the oil price, the Brent crude oil price, uh, how volatile the market has been. But the shell oil, the shell oil boom reversed when low oil prices put many of these producers out of business. In other words, it wasn't viable for them to carry on producing. So that's number one. Supply and demand would cause the price to go up and down. In our scenario, we're seeing a demand for price uh, for for oil going up. Secondly is the seasonal demand. We are now into our into our, uh, autumn winter scenario. Uh, so seasonal demand, especially in the in the in the, the states, we see that uh, all future traders uh, they know that demand for oil will go up as these guys go on holiday or go on vacation. They fill up the the uh, um, the, the, the trucks or the, those big camper vans and they start buying these oil future contracts in, in, in anticipation that the price will rise. And saying that, uh, these same guys, these commodity traders are also causing high oil prices. They buy oil and gasoline as a commodity market, uh, on, on the commodity markets. And the idea is that these guys buy the con contracts for future delivery at a grip on price. But the whole idea is that these guys obviously enjoy, uh, the game is to make a profit. So they buy up with, and with the idea of selling at a higher price, and obviously that's how they make the profits. Um, the main thing is that um, this supply and demand, this, um, call it uh, trading by these um, traders, are causing the uh, the price to go up. So we have this perception that the oil price will always go higher, and it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. And ultimately, this will lead to what they call an asset bubble. And unfortunately, uh, those that pay for this asset bubble is you and me. Okay, so those are just some of the reasons why the oil price will go up. Um, here's a graph of the oil price, Brent crude price, going right back to 1990. You can see uh, how nice and volatile it is. And more recently, if I can bring my little curse in here, uh, my spotlight, you can see how this, this is a, a 50 and a 200 week moving average. That was what they call the death cross. So as long as the prices stay below that, the price, uh, we had a, what they call a bear market for prices, which is great for for um, inflation. But now recently, you can see it's about across. We haven't be, had that for a long time. Way back in 2009 was the last time. But the whole idea of this graph is pointing that we've got upside potential. So we're going to go try and, the, the, they must probably try and manipulate the price up to $100, as I say, with uh, OPEC. Okay. Let me go back to my normal point of view. But um, also the reason why oil prices um, rise is when the, when the dollar weakens or declines as such. So you can see that um, uh, we also understand that the oil, is, oil price contracts are denominated in US dollars. This is why oil prices rose between 2002 and 2014. And then the, because the dollar had lost 40% of its value during that time. Oil prices fell in 2015 and 2016, and this obviously helped the, Alp the OPEC members to make more money while keeping supply constant. So more recently, we've seen that the oil prices have been increasing as a result of heightened demand. Obviously, Trump speaking up, uh, speaking up the market, but also the crisis of, in Venezuela. There's a whole social, economic, uh, and political crisis going on there since 2012, since the last president was kicked out. Now we've got this new president in place, but there's this whole uproar. They're a big producer. The local market, however, together with the emerging markets, have been on the back foot for most of May and June as American markets jumped on the steady economic growth. That's number one. And number two, obviously, on the back of better than expected company results. So that's the reason why, the, in anticipation of, of economic growth, we see demand of oil and hence that, as I say, that self fulfilling prophecy. So what I found was interesting also is that um, higher than expected U.S. Uh, consumer inflation data that was released yesterday practically seals the likelihood of the U.S. Federal Reserve raising interest rates tonight. So obviously, if interest rates are going up, it makes the, makes the dollar stronger, and um, obviously that will have impact on oil also. So all these things knock together, come all together, and as I say, um, this is what you need to take consideration as an investor, how these things impact on the market. As I mentioned earlier, there's a bit of creating a bit of a tug of war, and I've tried to simplify it in this little 
table in the next in the next slide. Okay, so on the one side we've got higher oil prices, and that's obviously because of rising demand. And we're seeing that OPEC, as I mentioned just now, have been trying to curb or cut back on oil production for the last 18 months. That's number one. And the other side of the coin is that uh, we're seeing there's also concerns of future Iranian and Venezuelan output. So there's this, this balancing act happening at the moment. Um, so that's the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, we're seeing falling demand. That's if we have a lower oil price, but we're seeing that uh, the Russians have been increasing their production also, uh, as well as the, um, the U.S. drilling rigs. They have the highest activity in more than three years. So, uh, as I say, this is why where OPEC is talking about this uncertainty over, uh, uh, hanging over the oil markets, and this is exactly the scenario. So, this is balancing act going on right now. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah, that's, that's the one, so, uh, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, obviously, is, as I mentioned, is the weaker rent. Um, the weaker, the weaker currency carries the risk of pushing up inflation, and that's where, where, the, where the, the link comes in with the stock market. Inflation and interest rates are very, very much linked together. So if, if inflation is, is um, a big enemy, number one, just understand that most of our, our goods are imported, and uh, a weaker rent makes things more expensive. And oil is a big, uh, a big importer, uh, a big part of our, of our imports. And a weaker rand obviously makes it more expensive. Um, this means that this, the Reserve Bank, we just spoke just now about the Federal Reserve having a meeting tonight, and there's high expectations on them raising their basis, the uh, interest rate by at least a 25 basis point or quarter of a percent. So our Reserve Bank also faces the same difficult situation. You know, the rand's weakening could have not come at more of a week at the worst time. We've seen our economic GDP figures have slowed down, our economy has slowed down. So this is a balancing act also where we want to keep our foot on the accelerator for economic growth, but also you want to put your foot on the on the brakes for um, for inflation. So the Reserve Bank has this mandate where they have to keep inflation in a range between 3% and 6%. And you'll see a slide just now where it looks like the trend is starting to turn up and there's pressure for inflation to go up. Okay. So the recent um, um, rand de 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 deterioration may force the Reserve Bank to consider earlier interest rates. And we see all what happens after tonight's little move. Obviously, uh, if the rates go up in the States, we'll put pressure on the dollar, or the dollar will get stronger and, and make our, our rand weaker. And we'll see what, what our Reserve Bank does. But remember, as I say, they have a mandate where they have to look after that inflation and also obviously look at the, the um, economic growth. Okay, so it's interesting times. So if I move on, you know, we talk about the knock-on effects. And just to, just to highlight for you, and I've been talking to some of the people here in the office, a staff member travels from, our, from, the, from Joburg Centre to Bryanston. Our office is here in Bryanston. The commute in the past was 15 rand per trip. It now costs 17 rand per trip. So that's the extra two rand they're paying per trip per day, oh, sorry, in the morning and afternoon again, four rand. So that's four rand extra a day. This works out to 20 rand extra a week or, or extra 80 rand a month. It doesn't sound a lot, but if you're on a minimum wage or say about three and a half thousand uh, uh, rand, that 80 rand equates, equates to 2.29 percent. So, you know, I always find you know, a shame the, the poor little guys, uh, if, you know, most of their money goes to food already, and now you have to spend money on, on more taxi fare. And my, my gripe of this is that you'll see on the next slide, most of our motorists have to fork out 82 cents per litre. Um, the average tank, petrol tank capacity is between 45 and 65 litres. So we're paying between 36 and 50, 53 rand extra per tank. You and I don't really get affected by this. If you fill up twice a month, you'll be, be, be paying between 73 and 80, 73 and 106 rand extra a month. Okay, we take it in our stride. I did have a gripe with the taxi guys where if they got 15 people in the taxi at the time, pay them extra, extra two rand a shot, these guys are making five times more. <laughs> so that's my gripe. Okay. Uh, I got off the pedestal, so I feel better. But also, if you look at the at the small business owner, now these guys are dependent on obviously higher transport to fetch items from the wholesalers or the manufacturers. Um, if there's pressure for interest rates to go up, um, they'll have the, the, the customers or the consumers who have, have left uh, disposable income, 
And that's going to affect these guys' turnover. Um, as the customers obviously have to service high debt levels. But also, they're not in a position where they can negotiate uh, better price concessions with the manufacturers or the wholesalers, or they can't really push those prices onto the, onto the consumer. That's number one. So that's another impact if we look at our economy, the small business owner. Um, when it talks about, we talk about food inflation and the transport of goods and services going up. You know, the poor, or the poorer the person, the greater the share of the income that will have to be spent on food. Um, and obviously, the greater the, the impact on the disposable income should food inflation go up. But as I say now, obviously, the taxis are taking their little bite. And um, data indicates that the very poorest of South Africans are spending as much as 80% of their income on food. So can you see how this knock on effect could have a social, economic, and political uh, impact? So there's interesting times ahead, as I mentioned. Okay. <laughs> so let's get into the more than the nitty-gritties. Um, the influence of, of um, inflation on interest rates. So this is our got through. Oops, let me go one slide back. You can see until um, March, we had a nice little decline all the way back to where in March, our CPI figures were 3.8. Um, and then suddenly we jumped up to, in April to 4.5. And that was on the back of, remember, this is just before um, uh, the 1% uh, increase in value, value added tax, that's number one. And number two, uh, there were price increases um, with product groups that extract specific taxes, namely alcohol, fuel, and sugary tax, all those kind of things from the budget speech and things like that. And hence, our uh, uh, inflation jumped to 4.5% in April. Um, the expectations, however, the, the market expectation was 4.7, so this came out came in better than expected. But the point is, uh, in March, we were four point, uh, at 3.8. Interesting. Um, the highest inflation rate since December last year, um, this is mainly due to the prices of non-food uh, and alcoholic uh, beverages, as well as housing and utilities. So those are, that's also some of the reasons why inflation uh, ticked up. So inflation, as I say, the Reserve Bank has got its target to keep inflation between 3 and 6%, so it's still in that range. However, if you look at um, the other side of the coin, is um, interest rates. In May, the Monetary Policy Committee of the, the uh, Reserve Bank decided to keep the repo rate um, unchanged at 6.5%, which was in line with expectations of the economist. But saying that, at the previous meeting in March, the MPC, or the Monetary Policy Committee meeting, decided to, keep, to cut interest rates by 25 basis points. And that's obviously on the back of a strong RAND. If you can remember so far back, we had a quite a strong RAND. Um, everything looked hokey-dory for, uh, for inflation. Um, but anyway, they, uh, they, the, the, they cut the interest rate, the repo rate to 6.5%, and the prime lending rate was uh, was 10%. So this is what this graph showing you the, where we are right now. Now, the repo rate, by the way, is the benchmark. Those of you that don't know, it's the benchmark interest rate at which the central bank or reserve bank lends money to the commercial banks. Okay, so that's the repo rate. The prime rate is the rate at which the commercial banks lends money to the borrowers. Okay, so you can see where we were in the past. We have been as high as uh, on the repo rate is at 17. We're now down at 10. But there's expectations, you know, based on, on, on the past, uh, every time that... Uh, uh, fuel prices go up, there's an inflationary um, impact, and if inflation goes up, interest rates go up. Okay, so uh, this is where it all fits together. And, um, yeah, you know, if you look at what happened yesterday, or if you look at the local bond market, uh, yesterday the benchmark R186, the bid for that was at 903 from 898. Now, remember... It works in, in, inversely to like the stock market. When the share prices go up, it's bullish. Um, and obviously, when it falls, it's bearish. In the bond market, when the yields increase, the price goes down. So at the moment, obviously, yields are increasing, which is bearish Yeah, for, for the bond market. Um, Memo also said that the U.S. Federal Reserve is expected to raise interest rates to 2% from 1.75, that 25 basis point I mentioned just now. Uh, at 8 o'clock tonight, that's when they're having that little meeting. So we'll see what happens tomorrow, the impact on the RAND. So let's move to, to stock specific. What sectors or shares could benefit from a 
high oil price. So what would first come to mind and for most people would be Sassel and you'd be right. Okay, so this is a screenshot I got from Sassel. Just a highlight for you and this is quite interesting where Sassel, 35% of its business is, is, in, is in energy. Yes, a lot of the other parts of the business is byproducts of that. But um, Sassel, they market 60 million barrels of liquid fuels per annum. So they're quite a big player out there, okay? Um, they are global gas to liquids, uh, uh, call it an icon, and they have big business partners in Qatar, in Qatar and Nigeria. As I said, they also have a leading position just of their service stations. There's over 400 retail convenience centers. They have 11% of the market share in South Africa, and they're growing that, okay? Um, Ross, this is all interesting. 70% of their capacity for the electricity is from their own needs, or, for, or they could use it for their own needs. So these guys are quite becoming a, a, a self-sustaining. So that's just a quick screenshot. Um, this is from the latest financials. You see my scores, my, my um, uh, from the latest presentation from them. There's a source. So yes, Sassel, and just to give you some market stats or share stats on on Sassel, you can see the the size of the company, 316 billion okay so it's quite a large cap company earnings last reported and this is all based on yesterday's close um, eps was last reported at 11 rand 29 remember the markets were in cents their earnings yield compared loosely to a bank savings account is 7.73 percent the higher their yield the better their dividends they're paying out five uh, five rand a, 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 a per share the dividend yield as a percentage 2.62 the price earnings multiple is 12.94%, uh, 12.94 times. So we think that's quite a fair, well, we think it's fairly valued, um, not expensive. Um, you can also see the price NOV, they're turning at a, a let's say, 24% premium to its NAV. Okay. So the company has always illustrated in the past that, again, they have this ability to generate sustainable cash flows on oil prices around about 40 uh, uh, $40 a barrel so imagine what these guys are doing at 76 um, so it's a good quality company um, I like Sassel a lot I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it, we all know it's got an exceptional track record but, but you also be aware that it remains influenced by a number of external factors which have a significant impact on its profitability and it's not in management control. Number one, the oil price and obviously the exchange rate movements. So a weaker oil price, uh, sorry, a higher oil price and a, and a weaker rand does play in their favor to a very uh, big extent. So um, yeah, that's the one thing we take in consideration. Number two is uh, they've got this big uh, potential capital expenditure overruns in, in, in the States, they've got this $11 billion project. It's called um, Lake Charles uh, Chemical Projects. Um, and they've, they're worried about overruns there. But to a large extent, I think management is on top of it. Okay, so we think, as I say, the share does offer some uh, some value. The dividend yield, uh, yeah, it's, it's in line with the market. So there's opportunities there. So if you're going to compare Sassel now to its peers in the, call it in the chemical sector, um, you can see Sassel compared to ACI, Afrox, Omni, and Rolfs. Uh, we're not the cheapest. We're not the most expensive. Uh, you can see the oil and producers index. The PE ratio is quite high. So there, that gives you some insight into it. Here's the a chart of Sassel. This is a, a long-term weekly chart. And you can see how that's been performing. For the last four years, as the oil price has been moving sideways, or well, that little downward move, the, oil, the uh, Cecil price has been moving sideways. It's recently broken out again above that 200-day moving average. Um, there's a change of crossover. I spoke about the death cross just now, where anything's bearish below it. Yeah, we have the, the, the golden cross. Anything above it is bullish. So it looks like things are turning from a sideways market to an uptrend. So we might go retest those previous highs way back to 645 rand a share. So, um, yeah, that might uh, uh, something to put onto your watch list. Okay, and uh, if you had to think of any other oil producers on the market, the other one I could think of was Billiton. Um, but Billiton, the petroleum division only contributes 18% to their business. Okay, so it does, to a small extent, does contribute. But uh, if you're looking at Billiton's, it's something to consider. Um, market cap, much bigger than Sassel, 656 billion. 
Uh, you can see the earnings yield here, 3.62. Remember I said you want to compare it to the savings account. Um, you want to, the higher the earnings yield, the better. Remember Sasa was at 7% something. These guys are half. Uh, dividend yield slightly higher. So they're paying, remember these guys are paying dividend yields in, in US dollars. So the dividend yield more attractive, but look at the price earnings ratio. They put the multiple, very expensive. Okay, it's going to take you 27 years to recover the current earnings out of the current share price. So um, not very cheap. You can see, yes, it's trading at nearly at 89% uh, premium to its NAV compared to its peers, Glencore, Anglo, South uh, South and Azor. It's the most expensive in the mining in the mining sector. Okay. So if you look at some exposure to the oil, remember Billiton's more involved in, in the oil rigs offshore. They're very much involved in the Gulf of Mexico, and they've also got a lot of oil rigs in Australia. So it's a different way of looking at the oil compared to, to Sassel. Remember, Sassel converts uh, gas to liquids and, um, and the shell gas and things like that. These guys are the actual oil rigs out in the sea. So if you want to expose to oil, this is what you want to look at. So those are the two resource stocks that would come to mind. Um, now we look at who else. If we're looking at into Africa, uh, the first one that came to my mind, I was looking at any some of the retailers. And sorry, here we go. I forgot to bring, bring up the graph. Here's bulletins. Um, you can see again, it's crossing that moving average. So it's looking positive. We might go retest those highs again. So you can see how this is a little bit of a recovery over the last two, three years on, on bulletins. Okay. Let's move to um, MTN. So as I say, when I first thought of Africa and, and, and Nigeria came to mind. So MTN is obviously operates in Nigeria. See market capitalization, 215 uh, earnings, um, 246 cents. They're not going to be a high dividend yield, and you can see why the inverse of the in, in, of the earnings yield is the price earnings multiple. Very, I think, are very expensive if you're looking at 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 uh, MTN, but it's a growth stock, and people are willing to pay a higher price. You'll see the charts just now; it says a different story. But if you had to compare MTN to the rest of the guys in the telecom sector. Is very expensive, okay, but it has a very attractive dividend yield, okay. So that's if you're looking at it. So the reason why I brought up MTN is, as I mentioned, is Nigeria, and Nigeria is the biggest oil producer on the African uh, uh, continent. Um, what's interesting about this whole scenario of Nigeria is, I think, if if the oil price goes up and, and the government should be making more money, but uh, when I was doing research on this on this topic, I found that um, According to um, to Wikipedia, as of 2000, so it's more than two, 18 years ago, um, oil and gas exports accounted for more than 90% of expert earning, expert, export earnings for Nigeria, but 83% of the federal reserve, uh, the federal government's revenue, uh, and it generated about 14% of the GDP, and uh, this provided about 95% of the foreign exchange earnings. And uh, about 65% of government budgetary re 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 revenues. So that is old news. Okay, over the past 40 years, Nigeria has emerged as, as obviously as an oil powerhouse. It's the largest oil producer in, in, in Africa. But the Nigerian government is shifting its economy away from its dependence on the black gold uh, on oil. It's putting more efforts into diversifying into gas, into gas, into rice. Uh, and there's anticipation that these might uh, yield a, a better growth for them. So it's interesting that um, that there's a move away from it. So we see, you know, is that, is that sentiment of the oil prices high in Nigeria? How will it impact on MTN? So we, we will see going forward. So here's a graph of MTN. Um, interesting to note that these guys are in the bear market. There's your, you know, we always talk about the Golden Cross and, the, and there's the, the Death Cross. So Look like we're moving sideways, very important support level here. If that breaks down, we anticipate more downside. So so that whole thing about the oil price in Nigeria and this move away from depends on it. We we'll see how it impacts um MTN. You remember MTN, um yeah, MTN South Africa contributed thirty-two percent to the group's revenue and thirty-three percent to the group's earnings before interest tax or what they call EBITDA. Okay. Nigeria contributed 27% to to, uh, to group revenue and 31% to the to the group's um, 
as I say, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. That's what that earnings uh, EBITDA, EBITDA data means. Okay. So interesting things with, with, with MTN. As I say, you might want to look at some of the other little guys uh, if you're looking at space, but I'm just highlighting the relationship between MTN and, and the oil price, if there's that link there indirectly. And then the one that comes up to my mind is also ShopRite. Now, this is from the, from the website. Uh, they're the largest supermarket retailer on the African continent. Uh, they have more than 141 billion turnover businesses in all their different businesses. They've got 19 different brands, okay, 15 different countries. Um, and as I say, more than 2,811 outlets uh, across Africa. So this is a nice little image to show you where these guys operate uh, into Africa and things like that. And what I was interested in uh, to see, just give me just grab some water. With regards to ShopRite, what comes to mind always is that if these guys are, are moving their, their, their stuff around, um, they, the, the higher oil price or the higher petrol price might, might affect them. But uh, it was interesting to note that uh, from, talking from Cape Town, bring my log, uh, uh, spotlight again, from there to Nigeria, okay, um, from its, its main distribution center in Brentfeld in, in Cape Town to the port of in Nigeria, the company's second largest market in Africa, okay, that's 7,000 kilometers. Now, Africa's largest food retailer operates, as I say, over 2,811 stores in 15 countries. Distribution is at the heart of the company's success. Okay, so that's quite interesting to read that. So, ShopRise extended centralized distribution facilitates the delivery of goods, making it one of the most efficiently operated supply chains on the continent. Now, what was interesting to read in their financials was last year the company commissioned a 123,000 square meter distribution center in Kilmore in Cape Town, and it's described as the most technologically advanced facilities on the continent. Now, the, the, what I found interesting also is that the center consolidates almost 500 suppliers and can store up to over, over 20,000 products. ShopRise has the largest fleet of trucks and trailers and operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week to ensure maximum availability of their goods, which is delivered on time, on a, on a time schedule. That was quite interesting to look at these guys. So this coupled with the ShopRite's highly advanced distribution centers and supply chains infrastructure, this gives the management greater control over, over inventory over the, eight, the, the 15 countries. But I also found what was interesting is that retailer has also a sophisticated route planning and scheduling, scheduling software, which in the, optimizes the, score, the, the store deliveries and reduces the number of trucks on the road. So these other guys are already anticipating a high oil price or fuel price impact on their, on their business. They're just maximizing the efficiencies. Interesting, eh? Okay, so let's move forward. Let's talk about shop price. You can see uh, market cap there. Price earnings yield, sorry, price earnings multiple, 23 times. You might think it's expensive compared to its, to its, its peers in the food and drug retail index. It's in line, okay? I know that SPA... Uh, very briefly, sorry if I go back, this part does operate within the southern country, southern African countries, and I know that goes far as, so, so far as Ireland and places like it, but um, ShopRite that was the first company that came to my mind um, uh, in, into Africa. Looking at the chart, you can see recently it made a new high. So it's just trading off its highs, but it's still very, very strong bullish. Okay, so this is a darling of the market. You can see why. Okay. So, peeps, in summary and conclusion, running out of time here, just very basically, my objective with this presentation was just to highlight the basics. A weaker rand will have impact on the market uh, and on your portfolio ultimately in the sense that it will impact inflation and, and that's expected to rise, not maybe right now, but there will be a knock-on effect. And I saw an article where the Reserve Bank will look for the first uh, round of uh, first uh, round of inflation if, uh, impact. But we can anticipate there will be pressure on the Reserve Bank to raise interest rates, and raising, rising interest rates will affect consumers' disposable income, 
Now, going back to the retailers, we're talking about uh, ShopRite into Africa and Spa into Africa. But yeah, locally, as mentioned, food inflation and uh, less disposable income. So interesting to see what happens on, in, on the retail space on this side. But we can anticipate the rising consumer indebtedness. But bottom line, to simplify everything, yeah, rising interest rates is like a seesaw, a seesaw effect. Interest rates go up on the one side and the stock market comes down. So this is a seesaw effect. So that's the main thing I want you to remember from this presentation. But in conclusion, you know, there are many things that can affect the market. And my point for this whole presentation is to answer that question, how will the fuel price uh, increase affect the portfolio? Bottom line, be aware that the things are happening around you. There's always opportunities you can take advantage of. Um, so, yeah, you know, rising inflation, be aware that interest rates might be going up. So, if you look at investing with us, you're not investing with us, yes, come talk to us. But um, be aware of these things. They all fit together. All this information is in the, in the media. Understand the impact of it. Okay. So, guys, uh, from my side, thank you very much. Here's my disclaimer. This presentation was for many for educational purposes. It's not to give you tips on shares to rush out there. Just on the idea of how the fuel price will affect your portfolio. Um, so, before I just log off, let me just see what kind of questions you guys have. Thank you for the questions, first of all. Okay, cool. Let me show you. Let me see the questions. Awesome, lots of questions coming through here. Okay, Tabisa, as I mentioned right now, are the shares that one could look at adding to one's portfolio in order to take advantage of the rising petrol oil prices? So yes, to a certain extent, I think Sassel is the first one that comes to mind. Um, Sassel will benefit from, a, from rising oil, oil prices as well as a weaker rent. So that's the first thing that will come to mind. Um, Sassel would be a, a sure bet. Okay. Uh, Gerda, I um, don't know why the slides weren't moving. Uh, it should have moved. Okay, that's a good question that came up here from Frankie. Will pressure on the consumer because of the higher fuel price negatively affect shares like Truist, Mr. Price, and Fashini? It's interesting to note, I don't know if you guys are aware, that, um, that the uh, retail um, sales figures were at due, were due out now at, at one o'clock. So um, there was a um, economist I read somewhere that was talking about uh, they anticipate that uh, retail sales figures will moderate from 4.8 percent, I think, down to 4.5. Um, as I say, I know it was out due at one o'clock this afternoon. But um, yes, to thank you. Bottom line, I would say that. Um, um, higher fuel, uh, high fuel prices will have an impact on inflation. Inflation will have the Reserve Bank will, if it's out of that range, that between three and six percent. Remember, we're at four point five, so we still got some leeway. I mean, when we start eating that the top, that top range, the Reserve Bank will be forced to raise interest rates. And if these interest rates go up, it will affect these guys. Because remember, a lot of these guys are credit. Uh, you'll have some defaults and things like that. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Oh, that looks like all the questions. Okay. Guys, thank you very much. As I said, this presentation will be sent out to you guys. And uh, until we our next webinar, is only in a month's time after the school holidays. But thanks for being on this webinar. We haven't done it for a while. And until next time, all the best. Bye for now.